On behalf of our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Pile, and the Liverpool Hope University community, I would like to welcome you to this special event and thank you all for coming to join us today. And now it's my privilege to introduce you to our speaker, Letlepa Mafilier, and his friend, Howard Grace. We are looking forward to hearing your inspirational story of a shared humanity. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm glad you're all sitting here because we want to make this interactive. We'll, we'll give an initial presentation, but then we want your involvement. M my name is Howard Grace, and I come from Newbury in Berkshire, and my friend Let Lapper comes from South Africa. He's been here about three weeks now, and we've done about 20 events in that time in different places from Newbury, um, that's Oxford and Reading, then we went to Birmingham, Coventry, Sheffield, and Nottingham, Newcastle, and Carlisle last night. So we're, we're getting around quite a lot. Um, at an earlier event that we went to, we, we, we had a very good session, but afterwards somebody came up to me and said, how did you two meet? So I thought I'd start off by telling you how we met, first of all. About 15 years ago, my wife, who's sitting over there, and myself went to a conference in Switzerland, and it was on reconciliation, and two of the speakers made a tremendous impact on us, on everybody. And that was Let Lapper and a white South African woman. And her daughter had been killed on his command. But here they were speaking together, and you can imagine the impact that that made. So I invited Let Lapper to come to Britain and uh, at that time I was running a program going into six forms all around the country and I took him to 36 six forms in six weeks to share his story. But I'd also videoed um, the lady, Jin Faree, um, telling her side of the story so the students got a balanced picture of what was going on. So that's how we met. I'll, in introducing Let Lapper, say a little bit about myself because our stories have come together. Um, after school, I went to London and studied physics at university. And then when I graduated, I had a completely different change in direction. And I spent the next 14 years working with a voluntary organization overseas named Initiatives of Change. During that time, I met my wife, who's Dutch, um, and we wondered what were we going to do together with our lives. It was in the 1970s, and we met up with a number of South Africans of different races who were trying to bring a change to the apartheid system at that time. So we went to South Africa and had uh, a wonderful time, but very challenging time there. And after four years, in 1979, I fell foul of the security police. And suddenly we were back here, and I had my wife and two daughters under the age of two. Um, and what do you do then? Well, I'm not going to go into that. But why did we have to leave South Africa? Um, many of you will know that in 1976, the South African government, which was d dominated by the Af Afrikaners, people of Dutch descent, um, and they had their own language, Afrikaans, and they decided in 1976 um, to have all black education in schools 
in Afrikaans language. That doesn't mean to say you learn Afrikaans, it means that history and physics and everything was in the Afrikaans language. And the, the young people in the schools um, couldn't speak that very well, but it was also the language of oppression. So you can imagine what they felt about that. And um, many young people decided to boycott schools, particularly in um, Soweto, which is a big black township outside Johannesburg. The response of the um, government was to send in the military and hundreds of school children were shot dead. Um, my wife and I were there at that time and um, I had many friends in Soweto, including the chair of the Student Representative Council, um, a 16-year-old boy, and he was put into prison for murder and arson, and I was able to visit him in prison. And he told me how he was being tortured, and under torture he had confessed to these trumped-up charges. But there were um, policemen sitting there listening to our conversation. Obviously, they didn't like what they were hearing, and the thought of a foreigner hearing all this um, wasn't, didn't go down too well. So what's the connection with Let Lapa? I had never heard of him. He was a 15-year-old student in school um, in an African village. He had experienced all that young black people in South Africa experienced at that time. But then hearing about all these school children being shot, um, that rankled inside him. And when he was 17, now remember, we often do sessions with six forms, and most of the students we're talking to is, are 17 years old. So at the age of 17, one morning he went off to school ostensibly, but instead of going to school, he went over the border to Botswana, the neighboring country, and joined the liberation struggle. What happened then? I will now pass over to Let Lapa to share with us what happened then. So Let Lapa. My name is Letlapa Mpashele. I'm from South Africa. Indeed, on the morning of 15 August 1978, I left my parents, my brothers and sisters, my village, ostensibly going to school, but I had made up my mind that I was going to join the liberation struggle. So I skipped the border into the neighboring Botswana. I joined a component of liberation movement because there were many components. I joined the Pan-Africanist Congress, the PAC. There were others, of course. I also joined its military wing, the Azanian People's Liberation Army. I proceeded to West Africa in Tanzania, where I had basic military training. Later, I went to West Africa, Guinea, where I did some advanced military training. I rose through the ranks of the guerrilla army until I became its director of operations. Well, war was meant to be army to army, soldier to soldier, but the reality of the war was very different because civilians were killed on both sides. As director of operations, the trigger point came when five school children were killed by a South African Defense Force, allegedly for being members of APLA, and that was not true. But they, or I decided that the whites had to taste their own medicine. So I ordered retaliatory attacks on white civilians. 
uh, some of the attacks or the intensity of attacks took uh, place in Cape Town. And there was a tavern, Heidelberg Tavern in Cape Town, which was attacked at my orders. Four people died there. At the same time, I had fear that I was going to be killed because a man who causes death is never free from death. So I did not want to die with my story. I wrote a book, my autobiography, Child of This Soil, My Life as a Freedom Fighter. I wanted my story to outlive me. Fortunately, I wasn't killed. Fast forward that, we had 1994 democratic elections, but still charges against me were pending. Later, I was arrested and I faced very, very serious charges, murder, attempted murder, terrorism, etc. Later on, the charges were withdrawn, so I became a free person. I had time to publish my book, and after it was published, I was invited by Cape Town Press Club to grace the launch. Actually, the Press Club volunteered to organize a book launch. I went there. There were many journalists, book lovers, typical of journalists. They asked questions, are you a terrorist? Do you regard yourself as a terrorist? Were you not involved in terrorist war? And of course, uh, you give journalists the same answers you had given them the previous week, they'll publish them. But in the audience, there was a woman just towards the end of the book launch, who rose up, identified herself as Jean Foray, mother of Lindy, a victim of one of the four victims at Heidelberg Tavern. And she had very, very tough questions to ask me. But of course, uh, I tried to answer them, but I asked if it were possible to meet after the formal book launch so that we have a, pr a private conversation. I'm not sure whether two minute trailer has been organized. Okay. Uh, is it? Yes. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of background here. Um, when Letlapa came 15 years ago, I saw the impact that it made on the school students particularly and decided it would be very good to make a film to get this story much wider. And um, some years later, I went to South Africa with a director who is a Palestinian Muslim from Gaza. He's living in London. And we went together with a, a film man and we made this film Beyond Forgiving. Um, we have a two minute trailer of it. For over 300 years, there was fighting in South Africa. Wars after wars after wars of resistance. I was now coming face to face with the person who was responsible for Lindy's death. For a long time, I had demonized the people I was fighting against. I had this perception of an evil person. For the first time, I met someone whose daughter died uh, as a result of my command. How does one move from victimhood to survivor and then to wounded healer. I can only speak from my own experience. That experience of forgiveness sparks me to share the story 
and I think the Tlapa as well. Storytelling is part of a healing process. It's a catharsis. If there was more sharing and understanding of the deep needs of people who've been marginalized, the world could be a different place. Well, Jean agreed to meet me a, a few days later in Cape Town. She asked me, she looked into my eyes and asked me whether I believed in God. I was tempted to say yes, amen, hallelujah. But being an atheist, I had to tell it, her that actually I do not believe in God. Then she had the second question, do you believe in spirituality? Yes, indeed, I do believe in spirituality. I think every human being has a spiritual dimension. So she went on, she said, in spite of the pain you caused me, I forgive you. It was like being struck by lightning uh, in a cloudless day. And there and then, I knew that I had a responsibility of paying that debt. It was like, you know, a, a debt being imposed on me, and I knew that I could not repay it because the full repayment would have been the resurrection of her daughter, which is beyond the bounds of possibility. But just to make a token of appreciation, I invited her to my homecoming ceremony. Remember, I left my village when I was 17, and I returned to the village 17 years later. So, the village waited until the charges were withdrawn or I had served my sentence. So after the charges were withdrawn, they organized a homecoming ceremony. And I invited Jean. Fortunately, she came and she delivered a very, very powerful speech that got the loudest applause in that day. And Jean and I have been to different countries. We have been to South Sudan, we have been to Solomon Islands, uh, of course spreading the message of forgiveness. And in the whole story, I don't equal myself to Jean because it's easy to be forgiven. It's so difficult to forgive. That's why Howard and I, as part of repaying that debt, we are going around, our main theme is shared humanity. And our Palestinian friend, mutual friend, Imad Karam, has produced the very film, he's a director, Howard is executive producer. And Imad has very, very profound uh, message to most of us who find it difficult to reach out to people that we disagree with. And I'll pause for a while so that Howard could uh, share with us what Imad has said about a journey towards shared humanity. Thank you. As we've said, Imad is a Palestinian Muslim from Gaza. And a couple of years ago, when um, Gaza was being bombed, he said a very interesting thing. He said that we Palestinians and the Israelis are both trapped in our own narratives. 
And I thought how appropriate that is for many situations in the world. It may be international conflicts or national issues. I think right now in our political issues, people tend to be trapped in their own narratives. But it's not just the politics. Think of husbands and wives. Often the same nationality, the same culture, the same language, the same religion, and sometimes they fight like cat and dog. So it's not just about them and us being people who are different to ourselves. So this, this vision of a shared humanity goes beyond just the cultural thing. It's for all of us. And um, Imad said, what is important is to live in to each other's narratives. And when you think of Jin and Let Lapa, totally different to each other, and yet they work together to give a greater message. The film is called Beyond Forgiving. Forgiving is one thing, what happens beyond that? Um, so this shared humanity, living into each other's um, narratives, they actually exemplify that. But Imad said another thing, he said, living into each other's narratives is important, but what we need to do is to find an encompassing narrative which we can all buy into. That doesn't mean giving up our own narratives, our, our own cultures and such like, and beliefs, but is there something that unites humanity? So that's what we're doing, exploring um, at the moment in the different places that we go, and we would like to explore with you now. Um, what we'd like to do at this stage then is to take a couple of minutes for you to talk to your neighbour or someone around you to see what has struck you most about what you've heard at the moment. Um, then you can comment on what you've heard or you can ask a question to let Lapa. It's not often we get somebody who's had his life experience join us. He's assured me he's very open to any questions, even the most difficult ones. So don't think, oh, I, I can't ask that one because it would be too sensitive for him. Do ask anything. <laughs> so after a couple of minutes, we'll open it up for comments or questions and then develop that into discussion. So you've got two minutes now to talk to your neighbour. Would you mind standing so that everybody can see as well as hear? Yes, okay. I wonder if you could have done the shooting yourself. Uh, um, there are two levels of culpability. Those who pulled the trigger and those who issued orders for the pulling of the trigger. I am more culpable than those who obeyed my orders to go there and pull the trigger. Even when there was the TRC, What's TRC? Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was headed by Archbishop Tutu, I claimed responsibility for all commissions, omissions committed by the army to which I was director of operation. So those who pull the trigger are more forgivable than those who gave them the orders to pull the trigger. But could you have done it yourself? Yes, I could have done it myself. And I'm simply saying the intensity of culpability, I am more culpable than them. Yes, I could have done it myself. Thank you. 
I've not heard that question before. It's a good one. Would you mind standing, please? Oh, no, you can't. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Um, Redclipper. So I, I just have uh, this very simple question for you. My name is Samuel from Ghana. Um, being an atheist and working with Jean, who is a, let me say, a Christian or a believer of God, how has been the relationship um, between you and, and she? Uh, you still kind of have a feeling that uh, there is this existence of God or um, with your belief, so you, 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 you doubt the existence of God and how, how um, does it make you feel working with uh, such a person? Uh, I, I hope I won't forget your question. Since you have said you're, you are from Ghana, I've been to Ghana, I've been to Nigeria, I've been to Zimbabwe. I just want to take this opportunity to express my apologies and sense of shame for what my compatriots are doing towards fellow Africans. Some call it xenophobia, but I call it Afrophobia because only Africans are targeted. We have got illegal uh, Russians, Chinese, Israelis, Western Europeans in South Africa, but none is targeted, uh, only fellow Africans are. And I apologize for that, and I'm so sorry and ashamed. Now, coming to your question, Working with Jean has been the easiest of jobs or the easiest of calling because she understands my position. And actually, she feels that religion has done more harm to Africans than good. That's what she, she, she feels. And of course, she's not a religious person in the traditional sense of going to church every Sunday. So, so she worships in her own ways. But not only Jean Howard, too, uh, is a Christian. Uh, and I find it so easy and fulfilling to, to, to work with, uh, with, with, with Howard. And with many Christians, Buddhists, uh, just last week, we were invited by a, an Imam a Musharraf in Nottingham. Nottingham. Yes. Uh, and I even attended um, a, a prayer session of the Muslims. And one of the victims, or survivors of my victims on St. James Church, he invited me to a church service. And I, I said to him, I do not believe in God, but I believe in human beings and I don't want to disappoint human beings. I'm going to church to make you happy, not to make God happy, because I don't believe in God. So yes, uh, I think it's all about humanity and less about what we believe in. Yes, can I just say that what we're doing at the moment is about shared humanity. And one of the um, aspects of humanity is our religious beliefs. So we're trying to bring together people of different beliefs. Okay, thank you. Um, I wonder if I can ask a question. Um, you took your decision in the context of the, of the national liberation struggle in the 1970s and early 1980s and, and the horrors of what was happening in South Africa at that time. So now with reflection of where you are today, if you were to go back to yourself at that point of command, would you still make the same order? Or, would, or has your perspective on the armed struggle changed? Faced with injustice, surely I would struggle, surely I would resist. But I have moved on and I've learned a lot. And one of my teachers has been Jean Foree. 
uh, 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 and of course, she, we discussed a lot uh, about other alternatives that are there that people can effectively resist oppression with. And even if we look at South African uh, situation, the armed struggle played a minute role towards the liberation. It was thanks to mass mobilization, thanks to dipl diplomatic isolation, thanks to economic uh, sanctions and sport boycotts. Were I to relive my life and face with the same uh, situation, I would struggle fiercely, but I would reconsider my attitude towards uh, attack on civilians and even uh, being effective without being violent. Well, India is the best example. When I was in the UK, Howard showed me a film about Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who liberated the biggest country in terms of demographics without firing a single shot. This was um, the Attenborough film, which many of you have seen, I'm sure. Microphone's coming. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your story. It must be very difficult. But uh, I have a little bit of knowledge of South African history. And you're not from the Golera side of the NMC. So my question, I guess, is how did they know that it was your group that committed uh, the killings? Because at that time, there were so many killings from any formed cholera. Because I am from the East Africa, and my country is a military government. And when people are fighting for freedom, there are different small cholera groups that form in the name of freedom. So how did they certain that it was your group for sure that did, did these things? Thank you. Where in East Africa are you from? Salam. Salam. <laughs> well, we never masked ourselves when we went into operation. And minutes after operation, we claimed responsibility. And even if we did not res claim responsibility, we, we had forewarned that now it's, it was going to be tit for tat. So, yes, uh, they suspected that it was us, and we confirmed that it was us. So that's how they knew. So was the NMC killing? Pardon? The NMC, was it different from yours? Oh. ANC? Yeah. Were they killing? Yes, were they killing? Okay. Well, I, I think the reason for the existence of the army is to kill. And ANC had a military wing. Yes, they were killing. Uh, they were killing both soldiers and civilians. Uh, I think if you can Google it, Magus uh, Tavern or Magus Restaurant in Deben, uh, and, and many others, so, of course. Yes, the ANC too uh, uh, did kill and did kill civilians. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask, what prompted your decision to join the liberation struggle instead of going to school? Was there something the school was not giving that the struggle was giving then? And then number two is, so you are moving from a sort of fighting to forgiving. Was there an experience that changed that face for you from fighting to now seeking forgiveness? What was there? Was there a kind of epoch event that caused the change from fighting as, as a director of operations mm -hmm. to start seeking for forgiveness from people? Was there a particular event that caused that? Well, earlier on, 
uh, Howard told us that hundreds of students were killed in Soweto in 1976. Hundreds of them. So I felt I was lucky to be still alive, but were their deaths in vain? I said no. Something must be done to achieve what they had dreamed of, and that something is liberation. Going to school, it was a good thing, but going to fight, I felt it was better because uh, for centuries, schools were there, but nothing, there was no movement on the side of the enemy. So uh, I, I felt that I should go to school. But I think this is a choice that was taken by most people in the wake of June 16, so way to uh, school up, uh, up, uh, uprisings. Most uh, youth, opted for military training than to go to school. Now, as, as for forgiveness, it, 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 is, it is a gift. If somebody gives you a laptop, you feel you are indebted to them. But they don't give you expecting something uh, otherwise, it, it wouldn't be a gift, it, it would be something else. So, not only Jin, but a lot of people who were hurt, some had lost relatives, loved ones, came forward and said they were forgiving me. Then, what was I going to do to return that gift? It was impossible to have the dead come to life again. So I felt that it is better to be on the same journey with them towards forgiveness. Um, have you ever had the opportunity to connect with someone who ordered the killings on the other side, if you like, if it's about shared humanity? Have you ever had the chance to speak to maybe some of the soldiers who were working um, for the government and killing, killing the black school children? Have you ever had the chance to connect with them and hear their side? Mm. Have you had the chance to connect with people who've ordered killings on the other side? Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it, it is not me necessarily who should meet them, but the parents of those children have never had the opportunity to meet the soldiers, <coughs> commanders on the other side, because to this day, they remain nameless and faceless. So I've never had the opportunity to meet them not even the parents of the children who were killed. I think that was one thing that really struck Jin, um, was that Letlapa took responsibility up front for what had happened. And there are many people in that sort of situation who disappear into the background and never take responsibility. But she felt he was man enough to do that. And that was one of the things that really touched her. G gentleman here wanted to um, ask a question. Yeah. L Lapa, I wonder if you've forgiven yourself. O all forgiveness on earth would be meaningless if it doesn't begin with oneself. So it's a journey, I'm struggling and striving to forgive myself. Thank you. Hi, I just want to ask, um, both the ANC and the PAC both had military rings at the time, which were both in hiding after Ravona trials, Ravonia trials and stuff. 
What specifically made you choose the PAC way versus the ANC? Was it the belief system or was it convenience based on where they were in hiding, in training? A good question. I found the ANC not militant enough and the PAC met with my militancy, with my youthful militancy. Well, I'm still PAC member as I'm speaking to you. So I can also ask one more question, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and it's, cause I'm from South Africa, I've just moved now. Um, in terms of how the country's developed post 1994 with the TRC and with the state of the country now in terms of like the fees must fall and now the whole hashtag am I next movement with the, with the murders and rapes of the woman going on. Do you feel that the TRC was an effective way and it's, it's the, it's, it was an effective way moving forward or do you feel that there was a better way that we could have controlled and helped move forward and would we have been able to move forward in a better way versus the TRC and how they did it? If that makes sense? Yes, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I had my own personal misgivings about the TRC and they are well documented because if you look at the TRC, 80% of the applicants for amnesty are blacks. Now we ask ourselves, were blacks their own oppressors? That's one misgiving. Another misgiving, people went or before they appeared before the TRC, they had to have lawyers. People from the liberation movement had lawyers from uh, legal aid, which means those are lawyers that you are not going to pay, the government is going to pay, and they don't even do thorough work most of the time. And applicants from the government will have the best lawyers in the country. Now, it's not about the best, or the bad lawyers. But if people are willing to speak the truth, do you need lawyers to coach you? I had a problem with that as far as the TRC is concerned. However, I don't think people, anyone in their right senses, can dismiss the concept of truth and reconciliation. So I don't think there could have been any measure better than the TRC. And the TRC, I think, it became a platform where people, <coughs> both perpetr uh, perpetrators and victims, came together, wept, and of course were healed. So, to in that re respect, I respect the TRC. Okay, I'd like to ask you a question now. Um, <laughs> when we came here 15 years ago, we went to various schools, and there was a school here in Liverpool. Um, a very multicultural school near Toxteth. And um, I had the clapper standing beside me. I said to the students, do you think that Jin, the woman, did the right thing to forgive Let Lapper? Before I tell you what the students responded, I wonder what anyone here would like to comment on that. Do you think that she did the right thing to forgive Let Lapper? There's a, a man right at the back there. I think in order for her to find peace within herself, she probably needed to forgive Les Lapper, uh, if, if not for Les Lapper's sake, for her own sake, um, so that she could go on throughout her life. Thank you, thank you. Any other comments? Anyone with a different no answer to that? Yes. Just just wait for the microphone. I just don't think there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer. It's based on the individual and how they feel. So if she wasn't to forgive you, that's probably her own internal struggle that she maybe can't come to terms with. So I don't necessarily know if there's a right or a wrong for forgiveness because you're always going to have it more on one side. Okay, thank you, thank you. So this lady thinks there's no, no right or wrong answer. It depends on the individual. Anyone else like to comment? There's someone in the front here. Uh, 
I think it's hard to accept forgiveness. You said at the, at the very start that it's easier to be forgiven than to forget. And I, I, that's not my experience because I don't think we let go of the things that we've done. But you've got, more, you've got your own experience. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's take this a little bit further. Um, Jin's husband, Johan, who's also a Christian, won't forgive, can't feel that. He hates Les Lapper's guts. So did he do the right thing not to forgive? Any comments on that? Yes. The microphone is running around. <laughs> Thank you. I will use my experience as a Christian and somebody who has been in Rwanda, a country which has faced, um, is it genocide? Uh, it's very difficult to forgive. We should all agree, even if you're a Christian, and the Bible says you should forgive. And what the system they used there to reconcile from a neighbor killing a neighbor, a husband killing a wife because you belong to different tribes, on, on the face, it looks like it's working, but when you go deep and talk to the people, it's actually failing. And that's why Rwanda up to now, they are still crossing over to Uganda, and they think it will keep happening. Why? Because they've not dealt, one, with the root cause of the problem. So going back to your answer, Ginny's husband, he was a Christian, but we have, as Christians, I don't know if anybody understands what they say, spirit of discernment. You pray and believe that God should show you the right way. And I'm sure he was, this gentleman knew this as a Christian and he made a decision after speaking or talking or praying to God. So I would not blame him. I don't know whether he did the right thing or wrong, but if he feels like forgiving him, he will feel heavier or more angry I would rather not because it can affect you depending on how you actually process forgiveness because sometimes the person you're forgiving has not got the punishment and you feel if you forgive him you'll be more heavy than even before though some people like to say if you are forgiven you feel light but like she said depends so going back yeah. to the gentleman yes he's a Christian we don't judge Maybe he prayed about it and he felt like, you be there, I be here. So that's my answer. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Um, the school we went to, the response immediately was a young woman in the front row, a student, put up her hand, and she was a Muslim with a hijab on, and she said, um, yes, she did the right thing to forgive. This is Jin, did the right thing to forgive. <coughs> because if she hadn't forgiven, she would have suffered more than him. She would have gone through life with that knotted up inside. Um, then a boy at the back put his hand up and said, when you see all the problems and the conflicts and the pain that there are in the world, yes, the journey thereon and the forgiveness, they did the right thing and because they're actually setting an example of the way forward for many other people in the future. So the girl at the front was thinking on a personal level, just like our friends have been saying here, um, and the boy at the back was thinking of society and what is needed in society. I then said that the reason that Jin forgave was because she's a Christian and Jesus' example on the cross of Father forgive them for they know not what they do. And then I said, do you think you need to be a Christian or a Muslim or a believer in God to forgive? So before I tell you the answers from the students, would anyone like to comment on that? No. <laughs> yes, there's a gentleman here. 
just in the second, third row here. I think um, as for forgiveness, it's more about strength of character rather than obviously it's associated with like religious concepts as well with like religious beliefs but to actually you have to go through like life experience and you have to have like internal strength and strength of character to forgive so it's more than just a relig it's it's about your character and your strength as a person okay thank you When I asked that question in the school, the teacher immediately jumped up and said, no, I'm an atheist, and I value things like forgiveness and try to apply them. And then at the side, a boy put his hand up and said, it comes from within. And we had a good discussion then about all of us experience an inner struggle. It may be about forgiveness, it may be about something else. Our beliefs, our faith may help us individually, um, whatever we believe. But I think all of us can respect the beliefs of others and engage in that struggle for ourselves. So what we are doing now is thinking of shared humanity that is a struggle which we all share. So we're near the end now, and what we've heard from Net Lapa is an extreme situation. But all of us, in our own ways, come up against difficult situations. And how are we going to respond to those and move forward? So we're not trying to get anyone into an organization or anything like that. What we're trying to do is foster that spirit, generally, of thinking of shared humanity, which is a far better basis to address our problems from than the them and us spirit, which often happens these days. Um, just before we finish, I've written a little booklet, 20 pages, on this theme of shared humanity, just to go with our little <laughs> journey together. There are some on the table at the back there, and a, a basket. It's two pounds, so anyone who would like to take one and leave two pounds, you're welcome. On behalf of Let Lapper and myself, Thank you very much for coming along and inviting us in the first place, and we much appreciate the interaction that we've had with you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>